Guten Morgen, Hamburg, wie geht's? Uh, that's about as much German as I have, apart from Moin Moin and uh, Meerschweinchen and Wellensittich. But I don't think we're here to talk about guinea pigs and budgerigars. So um, for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to be speaking with you about five of the psychological principles behind persuasive and successful products. I thought we would start with a little experiment. So I want you to imagine that we have 300 loyalty cars that we're going to distribute to people at a car wash. You have car washes here. So we're going to give people two types of cards. The first group is going to get one with eight stamps. The second group is going to get one with 10 stamps, with the first two already punched in. So my question to you is, which of these two conditions, the eight or the 10 stamp condition, will get the highest redemption rates? Put your hand up if you think it's this one, if you think people will use that one most and come back. No one? None. None at the top? All right. How about the second one? Hands up for this. <laughs> you're too smart for your own good. OK, yes, you're absolutely right. Even though the eight stamp category had a 19% uh, redemption rate, which is actually very high, the second had almost twice that. And so what was the difference between these two conditions? Well, one had eight steps that were requiring to be completed, and the other had 10 steps where two are already completed. So what the psychologists did when they actually ran this experiment in the real world is that they reframed the task so that the 10-step category was perceived as already undertaken and incomplete, as opposed to the eight-stamp where you hadn't even begun. Does that make sense? Yes, OK. And this isn't just offline that we find this. You also find it online. This is the site called Silicon Reel of one of my friends. His name is Brian Rose. He's based out of London. And he does all of these video interviews with people in the tech world and elsewhere. And what you find is, if you stay on this page for a few seconds, you get this pop-up. But it's not like every other pop-up. If you look at the top, there's a progress, progress bar that says 50% complete. Now, you didn't have to do anything. You just had to land on the page. So it's not like you've committed an action. And yet, because it says, almost there, please complete this form uh, and click the button below to gain instant access, and you have that sense of progress, you're much more likely to convert. So how does this work? Well, research has found that people provided with an artificial advancement towards a goal, such as the hole punch or a 50% complete progress bar, are much more likely to persevere and be persistent in achieving that goal. And this brings us to the first principle, which is endowed progress. The reason it works is because we like to stay consistent with our beliefs, our preferences, and our actions. And so we're more motivated to complete tasks that we've already started in order to re remain consistent with our past intentions. And what's interesting is that the closer we are to that goal, the more likely we're going to create that extra bit of effort to get over the finishing line. And these are two principles which you can activate as simply as, as basically using a piece of card with a couple of punches on it. It's something that's very easy to trigger. The reason it's useful if you're creating products is because it can increase the likelihood that people will complete the task that you give them, and it also decreases the time that they will take to complete that task. It's quite handy. So if you want to use this, you have to incentivize your users to take that crucial first step and also to give them a head start towards reaching their goal. And this can be anything from money off a first purchase, or if you're giving people games, the ability to download it now and then jump up a level. A great example in action, I'm sure we're all familiar with Amazon. If you look at the top bit, they're trying to roll out an Amazon Fresh uh, service, and in order to incentivize you, they give you 25% off if you pay 60 quid for your first purchase. OK, so this all goes on to trigger the next principle. And this is our tendency to continue an endeavor once we've already invested time, money, effort, attention into that particular project. And this refers to sunk cost fallacy. Now, oh, OK, I'm going to come to your word in a sec. So basically, the player, if you look at it in terms of a gaming context, a player is much more likely to return to look after items that they're dealing with if they've either earned that item themselves or they've paid for it. So there's a transaction, as opposed to something that they've just been given for free. So if we're taking a more rational economics or classical economics approach, you would say that a rational player would ignore sunk costs. If you spend time and money and attention in a game or an app and it's not fulfilling you, you leave it. 
But the real world doesn't work like this. A real player is very reluctant to discontinue any activity once they've already put the effort in. In English, the phrase we would use is, is throwing good money after bad. In Germany, you have this amazing phrase, which I believe I'm saying correctly, Lehrgeld, when you learn from your money, and it's an amazing hack. Well done, the Germans. So now every time I've invested time, money, or attention, and I think, this is shit, it's not making me happy, I go, ah. Lehrgeld, and so I walk away. Uh, and it's a really great hack, so we're, we're borrowing that one. Um, and that's the reason why things like this work. With Farmville, the reason that you collect those tomatoes when you really don't want to play is because you've already had the sunk cost of investing time and effort and potentially money. And this sunk cost of planting the tomatoes is enough to increase many players' desire to continue. And the same can be said for a lot of other products as well. So a great example here, this is actually a product that I use, it's called Headspace, it's a meditation app. They give you a 10-day free trial of their guided meditations, so it's 100 minutes of free meditation, and you do each of them one by one. So one of them unlocks the next one, which unlocks the next one. And by the end of the week, if you complete it with all of this time and effort that you sunk, into that particular experience, they then congratulate you for completing the free process that they've given you, the free meditation. And then they'll offer you a nice little nudge, saying, take it to the next level, unlock the rest of the Headspace journey. So you've got this sunk cost, you've invested 100 minutes of your time, they congratulate you, which is positive reinforcement, and give you a nudge to unlock the next bit. So actually, it's a very nice ethical use of this principle. So when people start interacting with your product, how can you get them to come back for more, to create more of a habitual pattern of use? Well, you can offer users the opportunity to log back in or reconnect with you at a predetermined time and place to get some kind of benefit or reward. This is what we do in the UK, and I'm sure here. Every Friday during happy hour, you physically log yourself back into the pub, and you get a good deal on your drinks. You also get it, this is my local sushi shop, 15% off, um, every Wednesday. You just log in every Wednesday and you get 15% off. Or if you're in Austin or other places, when I was there for South by Southwest, Lyft, which is a competitor to Uber, were providing um, appointment dynamic-based uh, kind of offers so that between 12.30 in the morning and 4 a.m., when you're probably quite drunk, you can log back in and get 35% off all of your rides. It's quite helpful. This principle is known as the appointment dynamic. And it basically gets your customer to keep returning for more, creating more of a habitual pattern of use. So it's a longer-term approach to product design. So there is a way that you can actually put these patterns together to help you in the design of the products that you might make. The first is to start with endowed progress. So give people a relevant initial action to help your customers begin. Find a way to incentivize them to take the first step. This will then activate the principle of consistency, so people will be kind of encouraged to remain consistent with their own previous intentions. I've started, so I'll continue. At which point they've invested time, effort, and money, which encourages further investment, because they've got that sunk cost. At that point, to engage habitual use, you create an appointment dy dynamic so that you enable them to log back in at a particular time and date to get a reward. I will also put these slides on SlideShare, so um, don't feel like you have to take everything down. Okay. So if you want to use it, you have to research what motivates your users, and you can do that in a number of ways. And then you have to be able to provide them with relevant initial progress for free, something that they'll find desirable. And then you can use these principles to create a much more compelling user journey. You can also encourage repeat business by making it easier for people to convert in the first place. Now, the thing here is that all of us have a very limited cognitive and attentional capacity. We were hearing Tariq saying earlier about how people are streamlining the apps that they use on their phone. We're trying to reduce the amount of attention that we're having to spend on these products. And so to encourage conversion, you have to be able to lower the mental effort that it requires of your customers. This principle is known as cognitive load, and it basically refers to the load that performing a task will place on your cognitive system. So essentially the total amount of mental effort that you are spending in your working memory to do something. So if you have your tax return, that's going to take a high cognitive load, a lot of mental effort, versus making a cup of tea, which is going to take very little. So the closer you can get it to being easy, like making a cup of tea, the more people will convert. 
The king of conversion in this sense of low in cognitive load is, of course, Amazon with their buy now with one click. It also reduces the pain of paying. Researchers found that if I were to pinch you or give you a fiver or take a fiver, rather, pinch you or demand money, there are similar areas of the brain that will become activated, so you actually phys physically experience a sense of pain. So if you can remove dollar signs or euro signs or mentions of money and actually even the process by which people pay, so the PayPal or the credit card, into, well, yeah, a bit where you're kind of doing that paying interval, with something like this that makes it frictionless, people are much more likely to do it because they don't feel the same cost. Another great example is this British brand, Barstorm, who reduced the cognitive load by chunking the checkout process into single, completable steps. So you log in, you have to sign up, step one, super easy. The second bit, you've got the billing and information, and every time you finish one specific step, it goes green and it ticks it for you, so you get a sense of positive reinforcement. It's quite a handy way of encouraging people to complete. Um, as opposed to the other way, which is having the asterisks, so that every time someone makes a mistake, they get penalized and it comes up in red. That's a really bad experience. Another great example of reduction in cognitive load can be found in Obama's initial presidential campaign all the way back. Originally, their sign-up page for donations looked like this. So you've got a lot of text, a lot of forms, and if you were to land on the site, you'd, your heart would probably sink. You think, oh, God, that's actually quite a lot of work for me to do. So Carl Rush, who headed up um, the testing team there, decided to make some changes to the page. And this is what they did. So straight away, you can see that they chunked the page itself into two specific segments. At the top, you have the image. And actually, Obama is looking towards the payment section, so we're tracking eye gaze. And then you have a super easy selection from which to choose. So you could pre-select something which has been offered or enter a different amount. And you'll see at the top, there's a process, a process, a progress bar of four steps so you can see exactly where you are in the journey. It reduces your cognitive load. And the other thing that they've done, if you notice at the bottom, there is so much more text on the right version of the page versus the left version of the page. And yet, because of the way that they've organized it visually, it feels easier to process. Would everyone kind of agree with that? Yeah, OK, well, I certainly <laughs> feel that way too. And so did the users, because it made um, a huge difference in the amount of conversions and donation, uh, donations that they received. So if you want to use this, there are a few simple things that you can do. The first is to reduce the number of actions that your users need to take in order to achieve the goal. Also, you can split complex processes into single steps. And finally, a really important element here is to minimize visual clutter by chunking design elements together. So the less mental effort, always the better, at least when it comes to products. So conversion doesn't just stop there. You can also take it forward. And I think one thing that's really interesting to talk about is how you can get products to keep you coming back for more. So how do you think these three items encourage further behavior? I thought I'd start with Tinder. We are in the Reap and Vaughn, anyway. Anyone want to hazard a guess? How does it get you coming back? How does it incentivize you? Oh, you're going to make me work hard this morning. OK, well, apart from having gorgeous people that you can meet and do naughty things with, um, it also provokes you with the sense of a reward. And that's pretty much the same thing that's being done every time you get on Twitter or Snapchat, especially with apps with an infinite scroll or a news feed. You see the top of the next little bit, and you kind of go, oh, I've got to figure out if that next bit's going to be rewarding. So you keep scrolling through. The same thing with notifications, with haptic cues. Every time you get something that buzzes or pings or someone's phone go off, you end up doing that Wild West kind of like, shit, is it my phone? And then <laughs> you try it in a crowded room. And we are so primed to respond in this highly conditioned way at even the promise of a small reward. And the reason that this works is because they all trigger our dopamine systems. So discovered, discovered in the 1950s by two Swedish researchers at the National Heart Institute of Sweden, Research has since found that the neurochemical dopamine is critical in a whole different bunch of arrays of things that we do in day-to-day -day life. So things like mood, our attention, motivation, thinking, moving, sleeping. And most crucially, it's one of the most um, active components in our reward-seeking and pleasure-seeking and thrill-seeking behaviors. So we get a hit every time we do something that's pleasurable. 
So if we look at the example of after work or after conference drinks, by five o'clock this afternoon, you'll probably be really wanting a bit of a reward, having sat here and listened to people like me all day. So the dopamine system will kick in. You're going to seek something stimulating. So what do you do? You go get some drinks, you take some action. Here it's probably beer, for me it would be wine. And if you enjoy a long period of time with this, so you can settle into it and you're here for three hours and you're chatting with people and it's really fun, the opioid system gets a chance to kick in. And so you feel a sense of satiety and satisfaction, and actually it feels quite good. And so the system can rest and pause for a little bit. However, habitual products, especially the more addictive ones, often create what's called dopamine loops. So if you're sitting in a particularly boring talk and you're getting that sense of, oh, I could really do with a bit of pleasure and stimulation right now, you'll probably whip out your phone, you'll take some action, you'll scroll through Twitter or Snapchat, or you'll go on Tinder to see if there's anyone available near you. And this will basically happen at such a speed and at such a small level of reward, how much reward can you get in 140 characters? Not very much. That the opioid system doesn't have a chance to kick in. So what happens? You end up not feeling satisfied, and it creates this kind of perpetual loop so that you're seeking pleasure, it's not enough. You're seeking pleasure, it's not enough. You're seeking pleasure, it's not enough. And so it continues. And it's the same thing that many people believe is behind our information-seeking addiction. So what's happening with all of these things where we get so highly triggered to mindlessly pursue these particular rewards? Well, dopamine loops, the fifth principle, as we've just seen, essentially refers to a bunch of principles that kind of enable this behavior. The first interesting thing to note here is that in a whole bunch of different studies, it's been found that we actually get greater brain stimula stimulation and activity when we are seeking something. So we are more likely to be seeking something than to actually feel satisfied. And the same is true of anticipation. So when you're anticipating that holiday, that date, that drink, that cigarette, whatever it is, you might get more activity than when you're actually going on that holiday, in that date, smoking that cigarette, which is why many people are turning to mindfulness so they can find a way to rest in experience instead of just habitually chasing. Dopamine loops are most easily triggered by external cues. So the ping of a notification, it might be a doorbell that rings, it could be your email in your inbox. And it's a game that we play many times every single day. Um, and that's one of the things that fragments our attention. The reason that it's so effective, or the instances in which it's the most effective, are where the rewards are small and when the rewards are unpredictable. And this has been found across loads of different trials, also in other species, so in rats, in pigeons. We express the same high level of response rate, checking our emails, checking Twitter, when we don't know how big the reward will be and when it's going to come. And this is known as a variable ratio of reinforcement. Not that you need to know that, but for the nerds among us. <laughs> okay. So key takeaways, then. If you want to understand how to design persuasive products, you have to also understand the psychological triggers, the biases, and the motivations that move people to action. So the first, endowed progress, remember to artificially enable people to take those first few steps. You do it for them. This enables them to sink time, effort, and money into that task, which elicits the response of sunk cost. You can then create an appointment dynamic, get them to log in at a particular time and place to receive a reward. If you want to get them to have continued use, or also at the beginning when you're trying to get people to convert, lower the mental effort, lower the cognitive load, and make the experience as frictionless as possible. And finally, if you want to get people to really use your product over a period of time, you might consider the use of dopamine hacking. However, there is an ethical level to all of this, and that's why dopamine loops and whether we can use it ethically or not is what I'll be talking about tomorrow afternoon. Now, when we're designing products or platforms for people to use, there's one particular question that doesn't often get asked, although increasingly it's becoming something that people are contemplating. And this is where we sit on the persuasion continuum, when we use these principles to shape other people's behaviors. So on the one hand, I would say that we have the ability to facilitate people. So it's a win-win situation. Your customers will benefit and the business will benefit. At the other end of the spectrum, you have coercion. And this is a win-lose situation, in which the more unscrupulous businesses might say, well, doesn't matter what the client gets, 
we're going to make sure that we boost our bottom line and sod the other person. And I think that this is the key difference in my mind between persuasion on the one hand and manipulation on the other. And so as marketers and designers and developers, we are actually both the architects and the users of all of our future tech. And so I'd like to leave you with this question. What kind of world do we want to build? Thank you very much. I think we now have a little Q&A. Thank you, Natalie. That came unexpected, because you still have 10 minutes left. I know. Left. Well, I was conscious that we were running behind schedule, so I thought I don't want to, you know... Thank you very much. So I was I'm a bit too quick. I'm very grateful not, not for, <laughs> for not having to kick you off stage. Okay, good. Um, my first question to you would be, having just seen these dopamine loops, mm. and just, yeah, you just told me why I'm so addicted to all these devices. Um, how do you deal with that? Honestly? Yeah. Um, so I've removed a whole bunch of apps from my phone. I turn all my notifications off apart from my messages. Mm -hmm. I've actually removed my inbox from my phone also because it's just too fragmenting for me. Um, my phone is always on silent. And usually if I'm working on something which requires greater attention, I won't check my emails until I've spent at least two or three hours on that specific project. So, and there's a, a great book. If anyone wants advice on how to kind of do some of this stuff, a book by Cal Newport, who is a professor in a, an American university, I forget which. But it's absolutely brilliant, and it's called Deep Work, and I definitely recommend that you explore that if you're interested in it. So yes. how do I reach you then? <laughs> I'm on Twitter. I do check Twitter, and, and yeah, Facebook, so you're still, I'm on Twitter. So you're still addicted to Twitter? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to rein it in. <laughs> Any more questions for Natalie? We have microphones in the audience. Where are the hostesses with the microphones? There, there's a microphone in there. Any more questions? Okay, then I have one more question. You just talked wow. about this ethical thing between yeah. the, the difference between persuasion and manipulation. Mm. How do I make sure that I persuade my customer and not manipulate them? Because you just said, okay, you can hack into this dopamine loops. You can do it willingly or unwillingly. Mm. Uh, how do I make sure I'm not really one of those bad guys? I think it stems from the experience and the goals that your customers are having. So if you're going to, if you want to figure out actually whether or not you're having the desired effect, the question to your customers basically is, is this helping meet your goals? Do you enjoy the platform? Are we asking too much? I know it's a very simplistic way to mm -hmm. go, but very few people ever even ask that question. Um, and the companies that do get it right, like Headspace, have huge numbers of people investing in time and effort into their platform and talking about it, because it does serve a wonderful function, it's easy to use, and so you end up paying something quite high for an app which otherwise you might not, uh, well, for a price point that you otherwise might not be investing in. So, yeah, whether it serves your customers is a key point. Okay, you're going to have a session tomorrow? Yes. Yeah, so Five o'clock, I think. Okay, I, I'm not quite sure myself, but you can check on your app yeah. if you want to meet Natalie in person. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For Enjoy this your talk. day.